remember to record. There we go. So yeah, I think uh, let's get right into it. So the last few things that we talked about were trying to access indices of vector, indices of arrays that did not exist. You got horrible, horrible things happened, and the computer didn't even complain. No complaints, but we accessed past the end. We just touched somebody else's memory. Sometimes we got a runtime error. Sometimes we didn't. Okay? And so that was called undefined behavior. Let's get right on into the rest of it now. So, recap. Arrays. You can make an array when you, when you want to have one name for a bunch of stuff of the same type. So I can make an array of ints called R. Remember the little bracket brackets? I can give the one, two, three, and so now I have an array of size three holding one, two, and three at indices zero, one, and two. Okay? Arrays hold a bunch of stuff of a certain type. Arrays, they also, at the start, they have a size. You can say, like, I want array of size seven, and you can also fill it in, or you could just say, make them undefined. But all arrays have a specific size that cannot be changed, okay? Either implicitly or explicitly, you're telling C++ what the size is, and it's never going to be able to change. So you have no access to index number three or onward. You can't just add it in. It doesn't exist. You should have made a bigger array, okay? So yeah, just like strings, you can get it, those indices. You can index into an array and get or set the value. There's no dot i, it's just use these kind of uh, square brackets, okay? So you say r of i, you'd be like, let's update it. r of i equals whatever it used to be, plus one. That's a thing that's both in access. So that's supposed to be an i there. It looks like a one. Let's make it more clear. So you can access it. You could also set it with that same syntax. You can see out r of, r of some other index, r of j. Okay. So that is arrays in a nutshell. Are they coming back to us? Can't do that. Good enough? All right, the next thing that I want to show you is you can put if statements and if statements. You can put loops and loops. You can put arrays and arrays. Let's have multidimensional arrays now, okay? So the, the reason you would want something like this is maybe to store something that is two-dimensional. Two-dimensional array is probably the most common multidimensional array. So for example, you want to store each pixel in an image. How would you say which pixel it is, well, there's a concept of a row and a column, right? Maybe this is row zero, all these, this is row one, row two, and then you have column zero, column one, column two, you need two indices to get at which pixel you're trying to talk about and change maybe if you're programming your own version of Photoshop. So this would be, uh, this would be an array that is three by three, and you declare it like this. Maybe every color is an int, pretend that it is for now. You'd say R of three, three, multi-brackets. It's an array of three arrays, which each contain ints. And so you'd have to index in twice to get to the middle. So say I want to set right here to 42. That would be uh, row two, column one. And depending on how you're doing it, columns first, rows first, you'd say something like, well, that's R of two of one. Row two, column one, set that to 42, please. Okay, that's just new syntax. Uh, yeah, you can have a 3D array if you want. It's just, it's called multidimensional if you have multiple indices that you need to give to get down to the final int. Okay, so for example, if I made this giant array, R of 4284, what are all the accessible indices, the, the ones that I'm allowed to access? Well, the first thing I can put goes between 0 and 41, right? So it starts at 0. And then the second thing, I need to give that too to get to the final int. That could start from 0 and go all the way to 83. So I've got my options R00, R01 is next. This goes all the way to R083, right? It's always one, one less, 83. That's in one direction, that's the one column. And then you can go all the way then to R of 4183. That's the last possible index. Does that make sense to us? 
just got a new index. An extra one. Those are multi-dimensional arrays. And so just to prove to you that the syntax is exactly the same, let me just make a quick little program that does, I don't know, this or something. Just showing you that you can store it there. So, uh, multi-dimensional dots. So if I have an array of, that is, I don't know, three by four, I can set indices. I can be like R of two of one, set that to one. Then I can output that. Uh, R two of one. You can change all the ones you want, as long as they're valid indices. Okay, no real difference. And it gets our one in there. Can make it hold 42. But it's really just an array of ints inside an array of ints. You can think of it like that, or you can think of it as you need two indices to get to the final int that's being stored. One way or another. Are we good with that? These won't come up a lot right now, especially in this class, but you've heard about them now. Let's see. Uh, yeah, I said when I reviewed arrays, when I gave this recap slide, I talked about some things that arrays can do. Some of those things are bad, right? Like, you had to say what size you want your array to be. You have to think of that when you make your program. Like, this array is going to be size 100. I know it can't change, so this better be the right size for any possible run of the program. This better be enough. You have to pick that size up front. You can't change it. So that's too bad. Uh, also, arrays just sitting around, they have no clue what their size is. You have to store that somewhere else. Like, if you made an array of size 42, you need to remember somewhere that it's size 42 rather than 41 or something. Okay? Arrays don't hold on to their size. They have no clue what their size is. So you pass that along as necessary. Uh, and then also, we've, we've determined that you can mess up very easily and the program will continue sometimes. So you can accidentally access past the end of that array and be none the wiser until you get some weird bugs later on. 0, 1, 2, and 3. Maybe you try to access index 4, which does not exist. Or dotted 4. Not really there. Okay? So these are issues. Wouldn't it be nice if they weren't issues? So this is where vectors come in. All of these problems are not problems with vectors. And that's why I encourage you to use them. They're just so much easier to think about. But Vectors are built like arrays, and so I had to teach you arrays first. Secretly, once you get to CSI 41, I'll teach you how to implement vectors using arrays. Because deep down, they are, they are using arrays just in a very fancy way. Okay? So we'll get into vectors in just a little bit. But before we do, I want to show you something that's very, very common to want to do. Now, up until when you get into an advanced algorithms class at a four-year college, you're going to want to swap things especially when they're inside of an array. Very important when you're studying sorting algorithms, for example. You're trying to move stuff around in an array. You're trying to swap one index with another index. Okay, so let me show you the idea. So let's say I have an array. It has one, two, and three in it. And I would like to swap the values at indices 0 and 2 with each other. So I'd like to swap those around. I'd like to move the 3 here and the 1 here. Okay? It's a very common thing to want to do. So here's what you can't do. You can't just be like, all right, here's my array, 1, 2, 3. I can just say something like uh, r of 0 equals r of 2, and then r of 2. 2 equals r of 0. Does anybody see the problem with that? What would happen if I did that? I'll draw it on this one. r of 0 equals r of 2. What's that going to do to the array? It's going to set r of 0 to be whatever r of 2 is. So this will become a what? A 3. Do we see the problem now? We just lost that one, didn't we? That's no fun. 
Now these are both three, and then if we do r of two equals r of zero, well, you're just, uh, well, bring in the three. There's already a three there. Yeah, that's pretty useless. So the key, the trick is you better save the thing you overwrite first, because then you have it for the end. Okay. So the trick is to do something like this. Uh, one, two, three, zero, one, two. Before you overwrite r of zero, save it away. Save it away in a variable called, I usually call it temp. It's a temporary variable just for the swap, it, the swapping thing. So put the one in temp, then do these. Then do r of zero equals r of two. I'll put the three there. And then say r of two equals temp. One. So this is the code. It's int temp. We don't want to do this one. Int temp equals r of zero, save it away, then r of zero equals r of the other index, and then finally r of that last index equals the thing we saved away, temp. That will do this and correctly swap the two. Okay, so that is the thing I want you to memorize. This is how to swap stuff. Any questions about that? We see why it's necessary, right? Does that make enough sense? The pattern is, if you're looking for a pattern to help you remember this, it's always you put something in temp first, and then look at how the right side of the previous line is the first side of the next line. They kind of correspond like that. And then it, they wrap around to the temps at the end there. So that's the, that's the pattern. First, store r0 in a temp, then you better be setting r0 to the other thing. Then you better be setting the other thing to temp. They kind of like correspond. Oops. So these two go together and these two go together. Okay. Yeah, so that's swapping. Are you happy with that? Because now I'm ready to teach you about vectors. Okay. So arrays were around back in the C language, so they're old. Uh, vectors, just like strings, uh, C++ strings at least, the string type, those are new. Those are new to C++, and so they're built in the same way. So vectors are very, very similar to strings in that you don't use those angle brackets. You say dot at, like dot at works on a vector, which is great. So yeah, let's look up the documentation page for vectors. If you'd like to go there. Usually I just like to search for uh, C++, oops, C++ vector. And the first one is C++.com, so we're good. So here's vectors, and it's got some stuff. Vectors know their size. There's a size. There's a dot at. Technically, the angle brackets work, but you should always use dot at instead. And then there's something really cool called pushback that we'll get into. So all these things, go here, click on them, see what they do. Like, what does size do? There's some example codes. Like, all right, it gives you back the size, which is just a fancy number. Uh, Here's some examples of it being used, just like the string library. So these are vectors. Let's talk about them. So a vector is called a, uh, the, the, the normal term for it, vector is just the C++ version, but uh, in general, it's called a dynamic array. Different languages call their dynamic arrays different things. So in C++, it's called a vector. And the beauty of vectors, first of all, is that its size can grow. You can add stuff to the end of a vector with the pushback operation, okay? So if I have a vector, I'll usually say my default vector name V. If I have a vector V that holds one, two, and three right now, just like an array, zero, one, and two, one, two, three, I can push back. This adds a new thing at the end, adds a new value. That's a new element, let's say. That's a new element to the end of that vector. So if I say v dot push back right now on this vector with four, it's gonna make an index three and put a four there. That's pretty nice. Question?
you can only add one at a time with pushback. Yep. And that uh, should be clear when you click the documentation page. It's like, add a single value. That's a new element to the end after its current last element. Yeah. There are ways to add multiple things at once. There are library functions for that, but usually you'd use a loop. At least in this class, I'd encourage you to use a loop to add multiple things. Just call push back a bunch of times. Potentially in a loop. That's so what push back does. Pretty cool. Uh, instead of the angle brackets, you can say dot at. So instead of saying the angle bracket to, which will work, I'd prefer it if you studied uh, this way and memorized this way, v dot at of two, just like for strings. Because if you mess up with the, with the dot at, it will have a runtime error. It'll make sure it's a valid index. This one doesn't make sure. I'll let you do weird stuff still. This one will watch out for you. So I encourage you to do this way instead. Uh, also, vectors know their size with dot size, give you back their current size. Uh, yeah, super nice. And also, when you make a vector, you don't use the dot size function to do this, but you can set the initial size of the vector. You can also give it a bunch of initial elements. Like, please make a vector C++ with 100 values all set to 42. Something weird like that. You can totally do that. Okay? So yeah, let me give you a few demos of vectors, and hopefully I will convince you to use them instead of arrays. Two ways to make a vector hold one, two, three. First demo. Just call this vector stuff, I guess. So if I want to use vectors, I better, just like for strings, I include the vector library. Okay? The one uh, interesting thing about vectors is you have to say what type is inside of the vector. So instead of saying int r bracket bracket equals 1, 2, 3, so I'm like saying on the right side, hey, it's an array, and then on the left side, hey, it's got ints in it. For vectors, you do it a little differently. You say, I want a vector, and then you use angle brackets, less than, greater than sign. I say, I want a vector of ints. It's all one thing as a type. I want a vector of ints called v, please, and make it hold one, two, three. That's one way to make a vector of three things. Totally fine. And so let me prove to you that those are all there. So let's see how it v at zero, at index zero, and then a space, uh, then one, and two. This one could be a new line instead. This is making a vector of ints. You read it like that. A vector of ints, please. Those little angle brackets give the type of things you want to store inside of the vector. And then I can just, as usual, give them all at once, make a size three vector. No big deal. So there's my one, two, three printed out using dot at, dot at, zero, dot at, dot one, dot at, two. And watch what happens if I try to do dot at three, which does not exist. Normally, if this were an array, it would not complain. But this one is always a runtime error. That is lovely. Okay. Are we good with this? That's one way to make a vector hold one, two, three. This is, as usual, like an array. Uh, another way is to use pushback. So let's start an empty vector. Let's make a vector of ints called v2 and to say semicolon. This one's empty. This is weird. You would never do this with an array. You need to put stuff, you need to say its size. No use for an empty array. v2 is an empty vector of ints. And now let me add 1, 2, and 3 in order using pushback. v2.pushback1. Pushback2. Oops. Push back two, push back three. So it's now size one, it's now size two, it's now size three. It's got three things in it in order because back always adds to the end. And now let's output those. Same thing. So push back allows the size to grow. That's pretty convenient. Any questions about these two ways? All right. Let's have a fancier demo now. Let's uh, let's do this one. Let's get 
up to infinity elements that the user wants to keep going. Let's get as many elements as the user wants to type into a vector until they type negative one. That'll be like, hey, I'm done. I don't want actually I don't actually want negative one inside of my vector. Please stop. Okay. So yeah, let's get as many elements as the user wants to type until they type negative one, and let's put them all into a vector. Ready? So, I don't know. I'm not very good with names, so let's just say v3. This is an empty vector again. And so now forever, potentially, while true, infinite loop, until the user types negative one, let's ask them for a number. So yeah, let's enter a number to add to v3. Get it from the user. And then we can just push it back if it's not negative one. So if it's negative one, if n is negative one, we're done. So break, stop the loop. Otherwise, add n to the end of v3, which is just a pushback. v3 dot pushback n. And it just grew. And we have no clue how big it's going to be before we run the program, because the user can just type a million numbers if they want before they type negative one, or they can just type three numbers and then type negative one. That'll stop the loop. So v3 is going to get them all, and once the loop's done, the user must have typed negative one, so we've got everything we need. Does that make sense, why this is filling up v3 with the numbers the user types, as many as they do type? Because now we can just go through v3. Let's iterate through v3. Through v3, and visit every index. Okay, so four int. What's the first valid index? It's zero. What's the last valid index? This is beautiful. I don't know how big v3 is, but it does. It has dot size. That tells me the size of that vector. The last valid element, valid index is well. If it's a size five array, the last the elements, it, the indices go up to four, zero to four, right? So it's always the size minus one. That's the last valid index. So while i is, uh, keep iterating, while i is less than, strictly less than, v3.size, whatever it ends up being, i++. plus plus. Oops. Oh, gosh, there it is. i++. Plus plus. And so now I have, i is going to be all the indices of v3. And I can output every piece, v3 at i. And then maybe a space. And then maybe a new line after we're done. With all of them. Does this make sense why it's going through all of v3? First index is 0. The last valid index is v3 size minus 1. And it holds on to its size. We can ask it for it. And strictly less than does not allow it to go 2 here. Just 1 less. Okay? So that'll print out everything after I've got them all with this loop put them in using pushback. So, um, that's the loop to put them in, and then here's the loop to print them out. Here we go. So enter a number to add to v3, I don't know. 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. I can stop whenever I want by typing negative 1, and then everything up till then was placed in v3. Isn't that fun? Don't have to be in order either. Uh, enter number 5, 4, 3, 2, negative 1. It got them all. It pushed them back to the end, and it, then it printed them all out in order. Are there any questions about why this code is doing what it's doing? Can I get them all on the same thing for you? Looks like I can. Cool. Any questions about any of this code here? It's not really nice and convenient. So much better than arrays. Remember, their size can grow dynamically. Just as good as it gets. So yeah, well, we started with an empty V3. And then we added something. We added like five. And then we pushed back four. It added a new element. We pushed back three. Added a new element. And so now we've got a bunch of indices. And the dot size is going to return 3 right now, for example. Okay. We good with that?
All right, for my next trick, let's talk about iteration some more. So iterate, Latin root for to go, so go through vectors. We just say iterating because we're cool like that. You iterate through a vector, that means that you're visiting every index. Okay, usually from left to right, but it doesn't have to be like that. So uh, this was the, the normal way, the way that I taught you first. Here's how you iterate through a vector. You have a variable, your iteration variable, ranges over every index that you could go through, right? It's index-based. So that's, that's fine. If you have some v that is size 3, has indices 0, 1, and 2, this is going to work. i is going to range between 0, 1, and 2, because v.size gives you back 3. That's totally fine. That's the normal way. Uh, so let me show you that way first, and then there's a cooler way and that may save you some typing. But I definitely had to teach you this way because that's the most important thing for you right now. So iteration, that's easy. So I want vectors, so I'll include the vector library. Now, how about I make a vector of not ints? Let's make a vector of doubles. Vector double v equals, I don't know, 1.5, 2.75, That's just a vector of doubles now. Similar. If I want to iterate through it, visit every index, maybe I'll summon them all, maybe I'll print them out, whatever we want to do. The normal way is for and i equals zero, i is less than v dot size, i plus plus. Those are all the valid indices of v. And then we can visit them. See how at v at i. Maybe a space, as we've been doing. Uh, see out and l. Oops. So that's the normal way of doing things. That's iterating through this vector. There's a way to save typing though, and it's not this way. So that that's what we know and love. So if you ever forget, just go back to the index-based way. But there's something cool called a range-based for loop. By default, G++ uses C++17 version 2017. Uh, so any C++ version after 2011 lets you use this kind of syntax. It was new back then. It's called a range-based for loop. It only works for vectors. It does not work for arrays. So here's what happens. Here's how you do it. it saves you a lot of typing, though. For, let's say that V is a, a vector of ints, by the way. So you have to say this type for int elem, and then you give a colon, and the colon stands for in. So for every element, call it elem in the vector name, you say v. And then that's the end of the, the part of the for loop. It's a different kind of look, different way of writing a for loop. It's called a range-based for loop. And then, once you're inside the body, elem is always the next element. It'll be allowed to range over every possible element of the array. Or, sorry, of the vector. See out elem. And then a, a space or something. What this does is inside of the loop body, it's going to iterate as many times as there are things in the loop, in the in the vector v. It'll let elem be each element in order from left to right. So elem, the very first time we hit this body, it's been set to one. That's the first element of this vector v, my pretend vector v. So if you say see out elem, it'll print one. And then the next time it comes back to this loop, elem will be set to the next thing. It'll be set to two. And then you can do stuff with it then. Print the two. And then the final time you come through this loop, elem will be set to the last thing, the number three. And then you can print it. So this is just, it saves a lot of typing. If you want to go through every element and you don't care about indices, just use the range base for loop. For every int element in v, this, this is just a variable name. You can call it whatever you want, int x in v. Whatever you need. Oops. But it saves you a little bit of typing, I would say. Any questions about that syntax? It's not a normal looking for loop, that's for sure. It's called a range based for loop. Mm -hmm. No, it creates this variable for you. So here I am saying the type, kind of creating it right now. Yeah, you don't have to say that it exists anywhere else, it'll make that variable for you. That's actually what you're supposed to do. I'll make it on the fly, just like for a normal for loop, where this i variable doesn't exist outside. It's just for the for loop.
So yeah, here's the cool range-based for loop way. Save you some typing. So you say four, and then the type. Now, by the way, this is a vector of doubles. So for double lm or double x, whatever you want to call it, in the let's see out lm and then a space. And then a new line. No difference. So print them all again, as usual. So what's happening again is in the body, lm get or whatever you called it, lm gets a chance to be every element of v in order from left to right. Okay. So uh, yeah, if you don't need indices, it's a lot less typing to do that. You read the colon as in. Does that make enough sense to us? You can forget all about this if you'd like. You can do nothing. You gain nothing with this syntax. It just makes it easier, less typing for you. You can always use this index-based way. Not a problem. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I think I am... Good to move on if you are. So the next thing I want to talk about is sorting. We'd very much like to get our vectors and arrays in order to do a lot of stuff. So uh, let me show you how. There's a sort function in the standard library. So sorting. So if I want to make a vector, I better include vector. And so let me make an array events and R out of order. Seven elements. Um, and then I can make a vector just as easily. Vector int call it V. Just the same way. I can sort the elements of the array or of the vector with the sort function in the algorithm library. I want it. I better do it. Uh, better do this. Better include it. Algorithm. If only I can spell algorithm. And this gives us sort or the sort function. And then let's go to that. You can sort C plus plus algorithm, or it's somewhere here. It's in other algorithm. There's a lot of cool stuff here. I encourage you to look through it. The algorithm library is a really nice one. Uh, but here's sort and so it looks weird. It takes something called first, something called last, and it doesn't. It just in place gives nothing back. Just changes the stuff. It sorts the elements in the range from first inclusive to last exclusive. That's weird. In ascending order. Okay, that's all we really need to care about. But yeah, here's some examples of it being used. You have a vector. You have to say dot begin dot what dot begin dot end. Okay. Uh, sure. Let me try to walk you through this. The syntax is really weird. It'll make more sense when we talk about pointers later in the class, and it'll make the most sense when I talk about these things called iterators explicitly in uh, CSI 41. So here is the idea. You say sort, and then you give a start, sort from here, starting from here, to not the end, not to here, not up to here, but you give one past the end. That's what I'll call it. One past the end. You give a location not at the end of the thing that you want to sort, but one past the end of the thing that you want to sort, uh, and it just will never go to there. That's what it needs. It wants this to be exclusive and this to be inclusive. It, sort, it sorts from start to not really that thing that you correct. It doesn't go up to there. That's what it's doing. Uh, so yeah. You give sort the beginning and ending location of your vector slash array in memory. That's what those weird syntax things are doing. Okay? Technically, it's one past the end, but who cares? So this is all you need to remember. If you would like to sort a vector, you say sort, and then you give these two things, which are called iterators. You say sort v.begin and v.end if I go back to the vector library, 
vector. There are these things called begin and end that essentially give you back the memory location, the first element, and oops, where was that? And then one past the end element for vectors at least. You just need to remember to say them both in that order. So sort from the beginning of V to one past the end of V. That's what happens there. That's the syntax. That's the line that you use. And then finally, if you want to sort an array, you say it really weird. You say sort R. That's apparently the starting memory. And then you say R plus. You add to the variable that is the array. R plus the size of that array that gives you the memory address of one past the end of that array. I'd be happy to explain this more, but not during class. It's too confusing. If you're interested, though, I can talk to you afterward or in office hours. So these are the two incantations that you will memorize for now, and I can help you understand them if you're interested. But in time, you'll get them. But yeah, so all that I'm trying to say is if you'd like to sort stuff, uh, you do it like this. You want to sort an array, you say sort r, and then r plus its size. So this is size 7, so that'll sort all of r. And then if you have a vector that you want to sort, you say sort from v.begin, starting address, uh, starting place in memory, up to one past the end of that vector in memory, v.end. That's all. And so now, I can iterate 4 int i equals 0, i is less than 7, i plus plus, c out r of i, and space, and a new line. That'll confirm that the array is in order, and then we can say for int e and b do the same kind of thing, but using the cool kind of loop now. See out e, and then a space, and then a new line. Okay, so that is, uh, that's the code. And that's how you sort stuff. There's a nice algorithm function that does it for you. And now suddenly, these were out of order to begin with. Now they're in ascending order. Isn't that beautiful? So that's how you sort an array. That's how you sort a vector. This will one day be useful to you, I promise. Any questions about that? Honestly, you can get away with just memorizing this syntax right now. That's all you really need to know if you want something sorted. I admit, it's a very weird kind of syntax. Are we good to keep going? Because I don't have much left. Uh, I want to give you guys some time to come up with an algorithm, though. This is a very good skill to form, and I want to give you time to, to help form it right now. I'm not going to tell you how to do something. I want you to think of how you might do it, okay? Here's my question for you. I'll give you a lot of time to think about this together as a, as a large group. It's a pure instruction group. So, okay, here's the setup. Pretend we have a vector. Could have been an array. Not a big deal. But pretend we have a vector of some size. The size is arbitrary. It could be size a million. could be size four. Easier to draw of size four. One, two, three, four. Indices zero, one, two, and three. And you would like to transform this vector. You'd like to reverse its contents. So that's the starting V. Here's the ending V that you want. You'd like to reverse everybody. 4, 3, 2, 1. At those same indices. Okay? So you got to take the contents, flip them. Reverse the contents of that vector. So with your peer instruction group, so get together with people, say hi to people next to you. You don't have to write this down anywhere. Just talk amongst yourselves and see if you can come up with the algorithm, but see if you can figure out how you could reverse the contents of that vector. Maybe something we talked about earlier today could help. Wink, wink. Uh, then, also keep in mind that the code, your idea, your algorithm should work no matter the size of that vector. If the size is a million, it should still, your code should reverse it. If the size is 3, it should still reverse it, okay? you got to use v.size somehow, and not a hard-coded number. All I really want you to think about this is in terms of English. So be like, all right, loop from index 0 to the size of the array minus 1, something like that. You don't have to call v.size. You don't have to write code. 
but I want you to come up with some steps, come up with a little recipe for how you might reverse this vector. It should work just the same for a size 4 array, a size 5 array, size 1 million array. Okay, so take a few minutes to think about how you might do that. There are a million ways, of course, this is computer science, but see if you can come up with a way that will work. I'll give you a few minutes to think about this, and then I'll talk to you uh, about the standard way of doing this. So take like five minutes to discuss. Well, also the vector doesn't have to be sorted. It could have been like this. Still got to reverse it. Take another minute and a half to discuss.
All right, that's my timer. I heard some good discussions. We didn't have to go down to code, but a lot of us were talking about variables, for loops. I just wanted you to think about it in English. But that's cool, too. Did anybody come up with something that they think is going to work? Any, any people want to share? Yeah. Great. That is probably the easiest way you could do it. Yeah, great. Did anybody else come up with that same way? So you can make a V2, and you could iterate not from 0 to 3, but from 3 to 0 of the original vector, and push back 2, 3, 4, 1, and then you just copy them over to the original vector if the idea was to change V, not make something new. And you just go i equals 0 to 3 again, just copy over v2 of 0, v2 of 1, v2 of 2, v2 of 3, because now it's reversed. So that's one way to do it. Any other ways? That'll totally work. Was that the way that most of us came up with, or we're just afraid to say that our other way? All right, so... Uh, there is a way that does not require you to make another array. I'm going to show you that way. That's the cooler way because, say that you had a size 1 million vector to reverse, you might run out of memory making a second size 1 million vector, wouldn't you? Change million to billion or something, and eventually you will run out of memory having to copy it. So, we would like to do it in place. We'd like to reverse the, the vector in place without making another copy of that vector. Okay? Let me show you how. If I had to only change v by itself and not do anything else, I couldn't use another vector, what would have to happen? Uh, so if I had, I don't know, 1, 4, 3, 2, and I needed to change, like this, like... This 2 now had to go way over here, or 2 needs to go here, and then what was in its place was the 1, needs to go here now. What's the word? What, what thing did I show you at the beginning that would do that? That would just work with the 2 and the 1? Not quite. If I wanted to move the 2 and the 1 just like that, what's what did I show you? What was that word? You remember this word? Swapping? There you go. This is swapping the elements at index 0 and 3, aren't you? That'll get the 2 and the 1 in the right place. Boop. Swap those guys. And then, that'll make uh, 2 and 1. Right? And then you got to worry about these ones. You swap these two. Right? Swap those indices, swap these indices. 3 and 4, and suddenly you're done. So it's like you swap around the middle. Do you see why that would also work? That would also reverse the vector. It's repeated swapping around the middle. This also needs to work, and it's going to be interesting to notice what happens if it's a different size. So, like, I don't know. What do I want to call this? Uh... I don't know, V2 could be 8, 6, 7, 5, 3. And I need to make out of this a reversed vector. I need to transform it into 3, 5, 7, 6, 8. You could get away with that with swaps as well, but watch what happens. Like, you'd swap these guys, 
you'd swap these guys. And then in the middle is a 7 now. It's different when it's an odd-sized vector or array. You could swap 7 with itself, but that doesn't really make any sense. So you kind of stop there. Like, you don't need to do anything with the 7. So, yeah, that's interesting. That's an interesting thought. But that's the way I would like to show you how. And we're going to just brainstorm the idea this time, and then we'll come up with the code next. Okay? So here it is. Let's say that V has size 4. That's the easiest way. That was the original way that I showed you. You have two swaps. 0, 1, 2, 3, right? Let's try and come up with some sort of something that looks like code. Like if it's 1, 2, 3, 4, I need it to be 4, 3, 2, 1. I need to swap around the middle, so swap 4 and 1, swap 2 and 3. Let's try and figure this out, okay? So, uh, first of all, when I have a size 4 array, how many swaps am I doing? Two swaps. Good. It's not four swaps, it's just two. Because if I went and I swapped this one with this one, and then this one with this one, and then I did two more swaps, like swap this one and this one and this one and this one, it would be back to original. So I only want to swap half the time, half the size of the vector v. Okay. Good. So that is 4 over 2 equals two swaps for this v. Now let's see what happens when it's size odd, v2. This is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and I like to reverse it. So again, I would like to swap this one and this one, this one and this one, and leave out the 3. There's nothing to be done with the 3. It's already in the middle where we don't need to swap it with itself. That's kind of silly. So again, how many swaps? 2. Can I figure out how many swaps based on the size? If I divide 5 by 2, what do I get? It depends what kind of division I'm doing. If I do integer division, I again get 2. So if I do integer division by 2 with the size of my vector, I've just shown right, that that tells me how many swaps I need to do. That's pretty nice, because that'll tell me how many times I need to loop. Does that make sense? We're getting somewhere now. Okay? Now, what do we swap? So, uh, this will tell us how many times we need to swap, but what do we need to swap each time? So, uh, we have to swap. Do lots of swaps. So the very first time, this is 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. The very first time, regardless of the size of the array, I want to swap index 0 and index what? What do I put here that will work regardless of the size of the vector? What's the index that I want to swap index 0 with always? Can you tell me? It's always the last one. This one here, here it's 3 if it's size 4. Here it's, si here it's 4 if it's size 5. What's the pattern? Size minus 1. Swap index 0 with index v dot size minus 1. Does that make sense? And then the next time, there's going to be a pattern that emerges. Swap index 1 with not the last one, but the second to last one. That's v dot size minus 2. And then... You just need to do this pattern, keep continuing it as many times as you've discovered that you need to swap. So we've discovered that, uh, so dot, 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 we've discovered that you always have to swap with the green stuff. You swap your size over two times. So it's always size over two. Swap. So that... That's an algorithm. You loop this many times, size over two times, that's how many swaps you need to do. And then you set up this kind of thing. You swap in the first iteration, zero with the last one, one with the one before it. Keep on going, okay?
and that will legitimately do it right. So if I go back to blue, if I have this vector here, if it was one, two, three, four, watch what happens. Zero, one, two, three, and four. Zero, one, two, and three. So I have two swaps to do, and I'll do it in this way. Swap zero with v dot size minus one. So v dot size here is four. Minus one is three, so I'll swap index zero with index three. That will make four and one. And then I'll do this one. I have one more swap to do. I'll swap index one with index v dot size minus two. The size is four, minus two is two. So one with two. That makes three, three, and now it's fully done. Remember, it's only size over two swaps. So watch what would happen if I followed this pattern accidentally twice more, and I thought I needed to do it for the size of the array. Like if I need to swap index two with v dot size minus three or something. Because that would be the continuation of this pattern, right? Swap that one, and then swap index three with v dot size minus four. Well, four minus three is one, so that's gonna swap index two and one again if I accidentally continued. And that would make this uh, two and three again. And then if I swapped index three with v dot size minus four, well, size is four, minus four is zero. That'll swap indices three and zero one more time. That'll make it one and four. And so now it's back to the original order. Isn't that funny? So you only want to swap size over two times. That covers the other half of the array. OK? That is a reversal algorithm that does not require you to copy anything. Are there any questions about that? I'm going to implement it next class. Are there any questions about it right now? I encourage you to think about how you would calculate the indices that you want to swap. How would you save the fact that okay, in the first iteration, index 0 with this one. In the second iteration, index 1 with this other one. What would be your i? Like, What would you let your iteration variable range between? How would you use that to calculate the indices that you need to calculate to swap? Okay, so that I think is where I want to leave you. Any last questions about this? It's a very fun little algorithm. It's the first, probably the most complicated thing we've seen so far. It's a good one to know how to do. So let's see where we are uh, in terms of all this. So yeah, just lectures this week. So yeah, no new labs. Remember that you have a midterm next week, all that fun stuff. So yeah, I think I'm good to stop recording now.